So hi everyone. Um, it's three o'clock, and so we're going to start this first uh, lecture uh, in the Anita lecture series. Um, firstly, uh, I just wanted to check that you can hear me. So someone perhaps leave a comment. Um, there's nothing worse than sitting and talking to yourself. Um, as well, uh, I'm happy to ask questions, answer questions as, as we go, so please ask them if you're not sure about something. Um, I'm not totally clear on the delay between asking questions and then reaching my screen, so just uh, bear with me. You could help me as well by prefixing them with a question at the start, maybe in capital, so I'll see them. Um, and, and if I miss one, I'm ha happy to go back. Um, the goal of this lecture series is to educate um, students primarily, um, but you know, essentially everybody uh, in many of the basics of astronomy that um, in incoming grad students especially, they just don't have and they spend the first six months uh, learning um, about this sort of stuff and as supervisors we wish that the undergrad curriculum had prepared them so this uh, covers things from coding to uh, statistics to basic astronomy um, you, you name it. Uh, the astronomy, you know, nothing in astronomy is really that difficult um, but there's just a lot of it, a lot of terminology. Um, so, so the goal was, uh, th this came out of a survey that uh, that Anita uh, undertook last year as part of our strategic plan for theoretical astrophysics. Um, a lot of people saying they didn't feel feel equipped when they ended their PhD. That there was a steep learning curve. You know, there's going to be a steep learning curve anyway. But the more we can do to help, the better. Um, so, so what we want to do is we want to have a series of lectures. Um, at the moment, we're planning on one a month. But you know, if they become popular and useful, then we'll have more than one a month. Um, We'll see how we go, uh, but to cover many different topics. So, as I said, coding, statistics, basic cosmology, basic stellar astrophysics, or what, whatever. Um, the content of the uh, of the lectures will really depend on the people who are available to teach them. So, if you're listening and and you think you can do something like this, and please volunteer, um, I'm sure it will be valuable to everybody. Um, the other great thing about this is that it's recorded to YouTube, so we're not uh, just uh, giving a lecture to you at the moment who are, who are watching, but we're hoping to build up a repository of uh, a lot of fundamental stuff that people can go back and look at. And so if you're a supervisor or you're a student who's having a problem understanding something and the literature's just not clear, no one can give you a straight answer, maybe, maybe there'll be a, a lecture on on that through through this lecture series and you can go back and, and, and follow. So this first lecture is on cosmology. Um, sorry to start with a biased topic. I know a lot of people do cosmology uh, and galaxies but a lot of people don't um, and we want to cover all the bases as we go through the lecture series um, but my area of expertise is in galaxy formation and, and theory and so that's what I wanted to talk about personally. Um, it's on something that I, I have issues with every, you know, every couple of years. I have a student come into my office, I, my little H's are all confused. Um, you know, uh, is, should I multiply or should I divide? Explain this to me again. And, and they go away, they think they've figured it out, they come back, they explain it to me, they've convinced me they've got it right and I realize that everything I've done in my code is wrong. You know? <laughs> so then I go into a panic for the next two days trying to figure out how many papers I have to withdraw, realize I actually I did it right the first time, you know, and we sort it out. And so, so the goal here is just to sort of, you know, none of this is really difficult stuff. It's, you know, but it can get, you can tie yourself in knots. So it's, it's to lay it down, right, plain and simple. This is how it is. This is how the Hubble constant is used in galaxy formation studies, in cosmology, in survey science, and so on. Um, so I'm gonna. It's gonna be basic in parts. Um, that may depend on you whether you think it's basic or not. Um, so bear with me. Um, there are places where you you might disagree with me. 
So please, uh, please post a question, right? If you say, I don't think that's the way it's done, um, post a question or contact me afterwards or, or whatever. So I have a, a paper on this. So this, this all, you know, this whole topic for me came out of some frustration of trying to figure out how to put the little h's into some simulation data, and you know, it really makes a difference, right? Because you know, 0 0.7, 0 0.7 squared is a big number when you're talking about masses, distances, volumes, and so on. Um, and you've got to get it right. You you can't get it wrong, right? It's it's simple as that. You can't publish a paper where it's wrong, or you can't publish a model give that to people to use and then find out later that you screwed it up. Um, so it has, it has to be right. And so we were going through this process of checking, double checking, getting confused again and I figured, you know, we should just write this down. This should be like David Hogg's um, um, Distance Measures in Cosmology paper. It's a basic reference, right? None of it's new, none of it's revolutionary. It's all basic stuff, but it's in one place, it's clear, it's all there, you can go to it when you need it. So that, that was the goal. And so <clears throat> So the paper's called Damn You Little H, born out of my, my frustration at the time. <laughs> um, subtitled, All Real World Applications of the Hubble Constant <coughs> Using Observed and Simulated Data. Um, it's currently being refereed by PASA. Um, and uh, I've got the referee's report back. There's nothing crazy there, so um, you know it all looks good. Um, and I posted the link to it on our Google Plus page, so it should be somewhere very close to what you're looking at. Um, so you can download the current draft. It's not finished yet. Uh, well, the paper's finished, but it's not uh, uh, accepted yet, but it's pretty close. Um, <clears throat> so feel free to use it and to uh, print it out, put it next to your desk, and if you ever encounter any of these problems, hopefully it, it can be useful. Um, a final thing. No, no final thing. Let's get moving. Okay. Um, just to say as well that, you know, this is a bit of a new experience and talking to your computer screen for 40 minutes is not what I normally do. Usually the wall, actually. But uh, so, uh, so I've tried to prepare my slides in a more intuitive way. Um, if you want a bigger screen and you haven't done it already, click on the little YouTube button up in the corner, sorry, down there, I think. Uh, it'll break you, take you out to YouTube where you can have a bigger screen. Um, and if you just see me looking in that direction, it's just because I have multiple screens going with slides and stuff like that. So I'm trying to figure out the best system here. And, you know, at the end, your feedback would be useful too because, you know, we're, we're not getting paid to do these, of course. We, we, you know, we do them because we want you to benefit and, we, we, you know, we want our students to get better and understand more and, you know, to ultimately... Um, eclipses as scientists, so you know this is a, a step along the way, or, or at least we're hoping. All right, so this is how I was feeling, just in case you were wondering. Um, and there are some people who uh, might be listening to this who can understand this frustration that you have no choice with this kind of stuff. Your units, um, your constants, they have to be right. Um, you can't publish a paper without them. And they're such a basic thing that often you don't want to go asking people because you should have not, you should know it, right? Uh, and, and, and so, you know, you end up feeling like that. So I'm going to touch on six things. I hope I won't talk for more than 40 minutes or something. Um, so there should be lots of time for questions. Um, so ask them, and you know, if we finish early, great. Um, the, all the points that I'll hit on uh, are all the things that I want you to take away. So I haven't bulked it up with extra fluff or anything. I, you know, if you just leave with the key points that 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 I've made here, and you take them to heart, and they become useful, then I'll I'll be happy. So we'll do a little bit of uh, background. Um, Hubble constant and cosmology, so some history, where it came from. Um, then we'll talk about how it arises in the measurement of galaxies. Um, you may not have thought of that before because it's just always there, but 
It's a property of the cosmology, not a property of the galaxy. So how do we get from one to the other? It's actually really important to know when you start plowing through the literature, because the literature is a mess. It's always presented differently, not always, but often presented differently. And if you ever want to use somebody else's data or compare to some of their results, you really need to understand what it is you're working with and try and figure out what they think they're working with sometimes. Um, then I'll talk about some real basic stuff, but it still trips people up, right? Converting between different little H's. Um, you know, really, really important stuff. You, you, you can't mess that up. Um, fifth, theory versus observation. So the simulators and modelers out, out there will, will understand that um, the little H's often manifest differently. And so when you want to compare to real data, how do you do that? Uh, it's a pretty important question. And then uh, I'm just going to summarize it by the last cheat sheet you'll ever need. So, you know, it's just a number of points that if you follow all those points, um, you shouldn't go wrong. Right? It's, it's just laid out. You can almost forget about trying to understand it and just follow the points, although I don't recommend that, of course. Um, all right, so it began with uh, <coughs> Slicer. Um, most people think it began with Hubble, but as John Peacock would say, uh, Hub, uh, 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 Sliffer, sorry, I should say, had got a bit of a raw deal in, in history. Um, he measured many of the redshifts that Hubble published, um, for which this famous diagram is attributed. Um, this is the famous, you know, velocity versus distance diagram, the Hubble law. This is where it all began in, in many respects, although Hubble wasn't the first to make such plots. Um, and the reason why he was making such plots wasn't the reason he's currently now famous, but that's uh, for a different discussion. Anyway, um, on the, uh, I'm just figuring out my technology here, so hopefully you can see that little mouse there. So we have velocity on the y-axis, and you'll notice that Hubble screwed up his units here. He just has kilometers. Maybe it was an observer thing at the time, but velocity is in kilometers per second, of course. And on the x-axis uh, is distance, and basically what they were measuring here was the recession velocity as measured through the spectra versus the actual distance that they believed the objects were at. And those, those distances were measured using the distance ladder, so Cepheid variables and stuff like that. And so as we, we know now that you know, these things are related, but they're not the same thing. Um, and so here's the relationship that you find. And so this was some strong evidence for an expanding universe uh, and so on. All right. And it led to what's now known as Hubble's law, right? So the velocity is proportional to the distance, and there's this constant there. And of course, Hubble didn't use H naught in his original paper. Um, he used A, I think, or something like that. But he found a H naught of 500 kilometers per second per megaparsec. And this is what we call the Hubble constant. Um, now, 500 is large, right? We now know that H naught is somewhere around 70. And it turns out that at the time, the, dis the measured distances to Cepheids and others uh, weren't, weren't very good. Okay? And so there was really nothing wrong with uh, Hubble's interpretation or his uh, analysis. It was just that the normalization was wrong. Um, so I played a, an interesting game. So I took Hubble's data. So there's Hubble's data. And again, we have uh, our recession velocity on the y-axis and the distance on the x-axis, this time in megaparsecs. Um, and here is Hubble's data there. And I fit his original line, which is a line with h naught of 500 uh, kilometers per second per megaparsec. Um, we know that the distance, his dis distances were off by about a factor of seven. All right, so let me just do a really hand wavy thing and multiply all his distances by seven. All right, so I rescale them. So that's what his data would have looked like if he had a better distance ladder measurement at the time. So a fun exercise, take Planck. All right, so take Planck and use Hubble's law and use Planck's data for H0, and this is what you get. All right, so, you know, 67.3 is you know, Planck's measurement. It's quite precise um, using the CMB, 
But it's pretty amazing, you know, this is a, you know, a really robust measurement of a very fundamental property of the universe um, and something that, you know, has uh, huge implications. All right. So just to make a point that even though, uh, uh, well, you know, to, to drive this point home, and I'll, I'll be saying a few basic things over and over again, which we sometimes forget when we discuss this stuff. You know, so H0 is a constant. It doesn't change with time, of course. However, the Hubble's law actually does. Right? So this is how Hubble's law changes with time. So this EZ um, component uh, is a function of cosmology. So the matter density, the curvature of which we think there is none, and the cosmological constant, of course. Right. So these things have a redshift dependence, which means Hubble's law changes with time, but importantly, H0 doesn't. Okay, so just remember that. H0 does not change with time, and hence, little h does not change with time either. It's not a function of time, even though Hubble's law is. So little h was conceived to make it a little easy to work with Hubble's constant, and so this is the definition. Um, it's just 100 times this little h kilometers per second per megaparsec. It's the dimensionless Hubble parameter. Um, and so the fact that there's 100 there makes it convenient when little h is 0.7, Hubble's constant is 70, of course, and, and so on. Um, OK. All right, so just to point out that, just to point out that um, the units of uh, Hubble's law, uh, or is uh, uh, kilometers per second per megaparsec. And so you see there's two distances there which cancel. So the units are actually inverse time. Um, and so you know astronomers like to simplify things down. And so in doing that, we get what's called the Hubble time, which is just one on the Hubble constant. And you can see that as the Hubble constant changes, uh, if we found a different Hubble constant, it would mean the Hubble time changes. And it's a very rough approximation of how old the universe is. Um, similarly, if we multiply the Hubble time by the speed of light, we get the Hubble sphere, or the Hubble distance. Or we get the Hubble distance, which defines the Hubble sphere. And that is about 3 gigaparsecs with an inverse h in there, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, so, you know, here's this really important question. You know, the Hubble co constant is a, is a cosmological property. It's a cosmological property of the universe, right? So galaxies sit in the universe, but they're not cosmological. Um, so why do we get all these little h's um, appearing in our properties uh, that we measure from uh, galaxies? Okay. Um, it's a pretty important question, and I'll show you later why uh, why that can lead to problems if you don't, you know, if you haven't really thought about that. Um, all right. So let me give you an example. Right, so this is just the B-band luminosity of a galaxy, and I'm just saying, for this particular guy, it's 10 to the 11.3, uh, h to the minus 2 solar luminosities, right? So where does this h to the minus 2 come from, if you saw this in a paper, right? Because this, this is just a galaxy. There's nothing cosmological about this, but Hubble's constant is a cosmological property, right? So let me just show you. Right, so let's take these two relationships that we know. One, one is what I've just introduced, the Hubble constant. Uh, sorry, Hubble's law here with our H0, our Hubble's constant. And the second is just a relationship between velocity and redshift. Um, so if, you know, to, to first approximation, to zeroth order, you multiply redshift by the speed of light, and that's, that's the velocity, recession velocity. Okay? Uh, so a greater distance is this, is of course, not true, but it's just an approximation. But hopefully you can see, uh, you can relate then redshift to velocity to distance. And distance here has Hubble's constant in the denominator. All right? So if we go through our machinery, and not much machinery is required, just to put our little h in, you can see that uh, the little h, the little distance depends on little h in an inverse way. Okay? So we're talking about luminosity. Luminosity is flux times area. Area is distance squared, and hence, because cosmological distances, and that includes angular diameter distances, carry uh, uh, a single inverse h dependence. Um, air area carries an inverse h squared dependence. So if you use light, 
right? If you used a flux uh, from a galaxy uh, in a telescope to work out the luminosity of, of, of that galaxy, um, you, your measurement of, of that galaxy has introduced the little h, okay? And so this is a really key point. You'll find little h whenever you need to assume a cosmology in your measurement. If you don't need to assume a cosmology, you won't find little h. Um, your mass, right, the mass of you sitting there or standing there or whatever you're doing right now, does not have a, a little h dependence or a Hubble constant dependence, all right? The mass of your computer doesn't. The time on your watch doesn't um, if you measure it. Um, if you had to measure your mass or the time or something like that from across the universe, then it would pick one up because it's the measurement which, uh, which, 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 which introduces that. And so he, here's that key point, right? So there's a couple of key points that I want you to take away. And that little h, the Hubble constant, is a measurement dependent quantity, okay? And that kind of has a, a side point. Um, which isn't really a side point, it's almost the, the most important point that you could take away, and that is that little h is not a unit, right? It's a number, okay? This sort of seems so obvious, but I'll show you later in the literature how it's always used and presented like a unit. And this leads to a lot of confusion about how to do conversions. Um, so little h is a measurement dependent quantity, it's not a unit, it's a number, and just because this is so important, and I want you to remember it, I'm gonna show you now a picture of kittens, of a kitten, right? So look at this kitten, let absorb its cuteness, right? Okay. Now I hope you will remember this. Little h is not a unit, it's a number, okay? Kittens once more, there we go, right? I hope you have absorbed that into your head, right? It's very basic stuff, right? But it's always, it's often forgotten when we're, when we're you know, these things are actually do. When you're in the, in the heat of an analysis and you're trying to figure out how to change one thing into another or propagate something or whatever. Okay, little h is not a unit, it's a number, and it depends on the measurement, right? That's the only thing, that's where it comes from, that's why it's there. It's not some intrinsic property of the thing you're measuring. Okay, so this, this brings up an interesting point, right? That if the same property was measured two different ways, right, it might have different little h dependencies, right, because little h, Hubble constant is a measurement dependent phenomenon, okay. So let me give you an example of how this works and where a lot of people can get tripped up. One is stellar mass, right, so you can actually measure stellar mass a lot of ways. So we've already talked about luminosity, it has an inverse h squared dependence. Um, going from luminosity to mass requires some modeling and some assumptions, basically assuming mass to light ratios and some stellar population stuff, right. But throughout that uh, process, you keep this inverse h-squared dependence. So this is what I showed before with luminosity. Uh, equivalently, mass uh, measured using luminosity will have an inverse h-squared dependence. But it's not the only way you can, you can measure mass, right? For example, you can measure mass with dynamics. Okay, so here's our, you know, popular uh, equation that we, we learn in, uh, as undergrads. Um, gm on r equals sigma squared, right? And so this implies that mass is proportional to sigma squared r. Now, sigma is a velocity, okay? So velocity is uh, distance over time, and as I showed before, um, the Hubble time, uh, hopefully if you just go back and look, has a h dependence, and distance has a h dependence, so velocity has no h dependence at all. It doesn't matter whether it's cosmological or not. Um, however, we have a distance here as well, explicit distance, the, radi the distance, the radius, whatever. Okay, so if you measured stellar mass, or mass of a galaxy using dynamics, for example, or the mass of a black hole or something like that, then that mass would have one inverse h dependence. Using luminosity would have two, okay? So you can see where the problems begin. Okay, but as well, there's direct measurement, right? You, you don't have to measure things uh, cosmologically if, uh, if you have good enough observations. So, 
For example, there are methods, you know, reverberation mapping for black holes, non-cosmological distance measurements, and so on. Um, people do this, and and in that case, the, the number they get is the mass, the solar masses or whatever units. Um, okay, so let's say you had the same object and you could measure it all three ways. In, in each case, you get a number, right? Um, but the actual mass would be that number times the little h uncertainty. So don't, be, don't get confused by the fact that uh, you can take this little h and you can put it out with the solar masses or, or whatever it is, whatever property that you're working with and think that it's not part of the number. It, it is part of the number, right? It's, it's part of the number that you, you didn't know. So you factored it out but it's still there and the actual numerical value of the property you're trying to measure um, is the number you measure and the little h dependence. Okay? So that's really important. And, and how you measure that property may have, may have a different little h dependent. So let me say it again. Little h is a measurement dependent quantity. Okay? And it's not a unit, it's a number. All right, so let's have a look at the literature. Um, so, you know, this is where you're going to encounter little h, right, in two places, in your own data analysis and surfing through the literature, um, trying to make sense of previous measurements or whatever it is you're interested in, maybe pulling that data down and using it in your own analysis somehow. Um, so, Depending on how big your window is right now, you may not be able to read all this text, but I'm going to walk, walk, walk through it. So in, in, the, in the paper that I've written on this, you know, I've sort of outlined four broad cases that um, show how little h is typically being used by astronomers in the literature. Okay? And, and depending on which case it is, you, know, you have to treat it, the data that you're, you, you, you take or the figures that you take differently. So, uh, so the first case is that there's no mention of, of uh, H0 in the paper. There's no mention of the cosmology, right? They, they just present their results. There's no little H's anywhere, right? They just plot everything and give you numbers and, and be on your way, right? O obviously, uh, that's an issue, <laughs> and I'll show you some examples, some papers that are very well cited that do exactly this. You know, um, and if those papers are of interest to you, then that's a problem. You're going to have to contact the authors uh, to figure out what they've done. Um, case two, right? There's a mention of little h or h naught at the start, um, but then they assume this value when presenting the properties, and they don't show any little h's from that point on, right? So, so you know, other than that first one, which is clearly problematic, right? I'm not making a judgment on whether these are right ways or wrong ways, just that they're different ways. And if you're trying to figure this out, uh, and you have your own data as well, which might be obtained in a particular way, uh, it can be problematic to try and understand what's going on, right? So this is all I'm trying to do is just highlight. So this is quite common that people will um, just say at the start, we assume a cosmology of blah, 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 right? And then the rest of the paper, no mention of Hubble constant, no mention of uh, the little h's, how they factored into the properties or whatever. You just, you know, they've done their work at the start and now they're just presenting the numbers, okay? That's fine. So case three, right? It's similar, but they mention the cosmology at the start um, and they do the same as case two. They assume all those values when presenting their properties and their figures and so on. But they'll actually show uh, with a subscript or something um, the the little h uh, when they plot, make their plots or present their numbers or something. And they'll do that because they want you to know how it factored in. Let's say you want to convert to a different little h cosmology. If you didn't know the scaling, for example, of little h, then you'd be stuck. Um, you'd have to contact the authors. And so that's quite a useful way to do it. So that's case three. So case four is um, they would mention the Hubble constant at the start, right? But rather than try and give you the actual numbers, right, for the properties, the masses and distances and all that, the actual ones, right, they'll factor the H's out. 
So effectively, what they've done is a H-independent analysis. And they'll do this because they'll say, um, it's clean. It's the cleanest thing to do, right? Um, you can decide what Hubble constant you like, right? And you can put it in. And then you'll have the actual numbers. And then you can use those values in your own analysis, okay? Um, so a lot of people do that. That's probably one of the most common in survey science. Um, I, I've done that plenty of times, but I'll show you later some issues that can that can come up with that. Okay. So let me give you some examples. So case one, right? This is the case where they didn't tell you anything. Right? So who, 2004, this paper has nearly 200 citations. Nice paper, right? Plot the luminosity function of, uh, I think, Wyman alpha emitters at redshift six. Pioneering work for 2004. No mention of the cosmology at all. Getting distances to edge of six might be a little bit cosmology dependent, and so you might really need to know those those numbers if you want to ever use their results in your own analysis or make a comparison. All right, Shapiro, 2010. They examined star formation in uh, using Sauron data in early type galaxies. Same. Um, and and just so you don't think that I'm uh, just picking on people here, I'm actually an author on the Shapiro paper, and and in 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 the uh, in the little H paper that that's um, about to be published in PASA, um, I I give the a penultimate example, which I won't give here, of uh, me doing something very bad with little H's, you know, in a single author paper. So you know, it's we're all we're all uh, guilty, right? But this you know this is pretty bad. So let me just show you that. So here's their um, you know their key figure. It's a uh, a luminosity function, so here's the number per megaparsec per magnitude, and on the x-axis it's the uh, it's the magnitude of the Lyman alpha emitters, and here's the data, and it's all wonderful, but it's all meaningless because you uh, have no idea what cosmology they used, and these numbers could move around depending on the cosmology. Um, you know, if we want to be scientifically accurate, we have to do it properly, and it's not hard to. So case two, where they'll tell you the cosmology at the start, um, but they'll uh, then not mention it after that. They'll just present all their results with everything uh, correctly accounted for. Um, Schwinsky, 2010, Peng, 2010, both, both very nice and very well-cited papers um, using uh, Z Cosmos, I think, and Galaxy Zoo, Sloan data. Uh, they state their H0 at the start, then they'll just drop all references, right? So that's fine. So here's a ping result. Um, just to highlight here, this is at the start. We use a H0 of 70. So that's wonderful. And then they'll come to plot their mass functions, and they'll just plot log mass. And on this side, there'll be, uh, this is a density, a number density, so dex per megaparsec, right? So megaparsec is a volume, so distance cubed. Um, so, in theory, that would have a H cube or inverse H cube dependence. Um, but you've, you're assuming here they've propagated everything through properly, but that so that's fine. Um, although, um, you know, how were their masses calculated? Right, you might want to know that because maybe they used a different measure, and it's not an inverse H squared dependence if you wanted to convert. So, that's not the case here, of course. But anyway. Just to point out, you've got to figure that stuff out and hope you figured it out right. So case three, where uh, um, they'll do the same as case two. They'll say at the start, and then they'll correct everything. However, um, they'll put a little subscript, a little H in a subscript, uh, in to show you how they how they um, factor in. Now, here's two examples, though, that, are, that I was horrified. And unfortunately, I've lost the paper for the second one. In, uh, in, in my past, a little age paper, I put the wrong reference in. So I have to go back and hunt that down. However, two examples of doing this is Moustakis and uh, Kure have a paper where they at start define uh, H of 70, so subscript. So both these examples are using uh, um, Hubble constant of 70. Uh, and they'll define that as being equal to 1, right? Where H naught divided by 70. However, the second paper, this reference I've lost, uses H of 70. It, instead of H of 70, actually equals 0. 0.7, where H naught again equals 70, but now the appearance of H sub 70 
into a value of 0.7. All right. So, you know, you can just see in the literature that there can be issues. Um, Drawery uh, use H sub 70, but they don't say which one they do. I'm assuming they use the Mustakis application, but maybe they didn't. Um, all right. And this is just an example from the Kure paper of how, how this would look. Um, so here, now you have the space density, but now the, the H sub 70 is factored in. It's cubed, as I said before, and minus 5 log H sub 70 here. And so they've told you at the start this is equal to 1. Or H, so you know, log of 1 is 0. So these numbers are the actual numbers. All right. So this is a nice way to do it, as long as you're clear. All right, and this is just an example. Rory doing the same, H sub 70. This time the stellar masses. You know how they've calculated their stellar masses because they have an inverse H squared dependence. Uh, however, they haven't exactly said whether H70 equals 1 or 0.7. Probably safe to assume that it's 0.7. Oh, sorry, 1, I mean. All right, case 4. This is the most common case. There are plenty of examples in the literature of this where you just factor it out totally, and I've just given a couple of references, and just to show you what this looks like, here's a luminosity function, uh, minus 5 log h. Uh, so if you wanted the actual luminosities of these galaxies, you would need to put in your preferred value, just there, and you would need to evaluate this. And, and then that is the actual magnitude, the absolute magnitude of those galaxies. But the numbers that you're looking at being plotted here are not the actual values of those galaxies, because that measurement uncertainty has not been factored in yet. Okay, So you just have to appreciate that. And more examples, right? The literature is full of them. Stel these are all stellar mass functions. Here's the inverse h squared again. Here's inverse h squared presented differently. And this third one up here, there's just nothing. And you'd have to go searching through the paper to figure out what they assumed. So, you know, some some consistency would be nice. It would make it easier for students. It would make it easy, easier for the rest of us when we come back five, ten years later wanting to look at these results and, and, uh, and use them in our own work. All right? So you can see that there's, I think, a strong case that the, the variety in the literature doesn't help anyone, uh, and we need to come to a consensus. All right, so how do we convert between different assumed little h's? Okay, so you know this should be basic, but I see people getting tripped up by this all the time, including me, going back and looking through some old code, finding I didn't, I'd done it wrong. Um, sorry, I'm just seeing some comments here. Looks like my uh, my stream isn't updating. Um, All right, so Chris said, using Soran data as an example, uh, Chris Usher said, using Soran data as an example, that they don't say, say their assumed cosmology is a bad example because the galaxies are so close. Um, I would disagree, and I would disagree because the analysis, the motivation, the science that comes out of that, that work um, is compared to, uh, um, to equivalent Sloan and, and so on. And, and there are new telescopes and instruments that are looking out further for which this is important. It takes no effort to, uh, to do this properly. Um, I can tell you for a fact that it was just overlooked. Okay. And if someone had pointed it out at the time, uh, if someone had pointed it out at the time, um, then you know, we would have put, it, put in a, an explanation of what we used. So. It, you know, it's as, it's as simple as that. But there are there are other examples in the literature. Um, they're hard to find because the literature is so vast. But you you find them when you need something and you realize this is computing as all hell. Um, so all right. So how to convert between little h's? Okay. So it's really 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 easy. Okay. So you're not canceling anything here. So, you know, I see people, you know, here's their number and here's the little h, and so they think I'll put my number here so things will cancel and all this sort of stuff. That's not right. Remember, little h is not a unit. It's a number. It's just the number that expresses the uncertainty that you didn't know when you made that measurement, okay? So it's really, really, really simple, okay? All you have to do, here's an example. Uh, the mass of a galaxy is 
10 to the 11.3, and right, this mass has been determined using its luminosity, so it's an inverse H squared dependence. We want to put this into a 0.7 cosmology, okay? So just replace that H with 0.7, and then evaluate, okay? Simple. That's all you need to do, um, because that H there is the number you don't know. If you knew it, you would have just it would have just been incorporated already. In. Okay, so so it's very simple, right? What if uh, what if uh, an analysis has already assumed a H? So let's use the 0.7 example. Um, so this was uh, the the galaxy that we just converted, and now it's in a 0.7 cosmology. And let's say we actually wanted to go to 0.73. Okay, just Use basic mathematics. Reverse what you did just here. So divide by 0.7 to the minus 2, and then do what you just did previously, and then multiply by 0.73 to the minus 2, okay, to get the answer now in that cosmology. All right? So, so you don't need to do anything complicated. You don't need to overthink it. You just need to know what that H actually means, what it is, okay? It's just some uncertainty that you didn't know, but it's just a number. Okay, and once you know the number, it's just substitute it in. Uh, gravitational constant is just a number. The charge of the electron is just a number. Um, if you want to evaluate something with that, just put the number in, right? Don't go doing cancelling or any weird stuff like that, okay? So very simple. Um, and, and this sort of highlights, um, do you see why it's important to know the H-scaling? Right? So it's fine that many people, uh, many authors will just assume the cosmology at the start, they'll tell you what it is, um, and then they'll present all the results, forgetting about that. So that's you know fine, there's nothing wrong with that, it, except if you actually want to use those values, uh, maybe pop them yourself uh, over your own uh, results. Um, and then you really need to know how, it's, how things scale, where the H dependencies are, and there's, you know, a lot of the time, most of the time it's obvious, but it's not always. Okay, all right. All right, so you know the fact that a property can hold a different little h uncertainty can cause problems for theory and observation, um, and so I'm just going to try and highlight this. So any anyone who's a modeler uh, or a simulator will identify with this um, because we constrain our models against real data usually, uh, and and it's difficult uh, to, to do it any other way. And so we want to be doing an apples-to-apples -apples comparison. The methodology of producing data, theoretically, is very different to the methodology of getting an observation. Uh, and so these little h's can really, really trip you up. Okay. Um, so let's take two galaxies, right? One's in Sloan, and it has a mass of 10 to the 10.5 solar masses with this particular little h dependence. And here's my semi-analytic model galaxy that's meant to look be the same. And it has a mass, 10 to the 10.5, but with a h to the minus 1 dependence. And so hopefully you recognize from what I said before, in simulations, masses are essentially dynamical estimates. You don't need to, there's no luminosity involved or anything like that. Um, so, you know, these two galaxies have the same number out the front but they're not the same mass, okay? It's very important, they're not the same mass. Um, and so you have to start thinking about, well, what if I want to compare them? So here's, I'll give you two examples. Um, so this is Kitts, Bickler, and White using a semi-analytic model of stellar mass functions and comparing it to data uh, at different redshifts. And the, the main thing I want you to look at is in down the bottom here, if you can see it, hopefully, you know, they're showing their H's. Um, it's not clear, actually, whether they've factored the H's out or whether they've put them in, but it's a little bit irrelevant because they're showing a H squared dependence, which is the observational measurement uncertainty. Um, the semi-analytic model measurement uncertainty is only one factor of H, one inverse factor of H, okay? So what are they doing? Okay, so here's a second example, Bauer, Benson, and Crane. Um, and just to point out, uh, this is kind of what I would do. This is what I've done in the past. All my plotting scripts do it this way. Okay. So again, I'm not pointing fingers. 
I don't want to point fingers or say you're doing it wrong, and just kind of highlight that uh, there are issues here that, that need to be addressed and cause uh, confusion. Okay. So here's the second example. Again, it's a, a model. This, I think this is a simulation this time, a hydro sim, uh, not a semi-analytic model. And so here is some data from Cole et al. Um, a stellar mass function, and here is the simulation stellar mass function. Uh, don't worry, that's not a great fit. There's lots of science in that, and that's wonderful, right? That's why we do our theory. Not everything has to fit. Um, that's what we learn. However, notice down the bottom here, they have an inverse one in one, one uh, uh, h dependence here, not two. Okay, so. What have they done, right? I can tell you what they've done. I'm pretty sure. They don't actually say in their papers, but I'm pretty sure what they've done is they've multiplied one of those data sets by a factor of h or, or divided, depending on which way they want to go. Okay? Now, mathematically, that's fine, right? That's a correct thing to do. It will put them on equal footing. But physically, it's an extremely bizarre thing to do. And the reason why is that little h is a measurement dependent property or, or feature or uncertainty. So you're multiplying one data set by the uncertainty, the measurement uncertainty of another data set to make them mathematically equivalent. So this is a bit of a strange thing conceptually to do. And, and what it does is it leads people to, be, to think of little h like a unit rather than an actual measurement uncertainty. Um, which then leads to problems when you're trying to convert and do other and do other things. Um, so we have a question from Jake Crossett. Um, greetings from Monash. Um, I thought H has now been measured fairly accurately and issue whether or not 50 or 100 has been settled. Why not just use that exactly? Exactly. And that will be my crescendo. Um, and is definitely the, the take-home message of the paper. Uh, it, we know it well enough now that we don't have to factor it out. It's just another uncertainty on our measurements. There are bigger uncertainties, and we should just treat it like any other error, basically. And this whole problem will then go away, and we'll never be looking at little h's again. Okay, so exactly, I agree 100% with that. Um, all right, so key point here. Don't multiply or divide to get rid of extra H's, right? If you're watching this now and you're trying to figure out how the hell do I compare my observational data to my theoretical data, um, they have different little H's. Maybe it's a surface area of cold gas they will have, or surface area of star formation or something like that. They will have different dependencies uh, with little H's theoretically to observations. Stellar mass functions, I've already used that as an example. Do not try and be clever and make them all have the same H dependence. That makes no sense physically. Um, what you do is you convert them to the actual little H value, as, as Jake or Alexander has just pointed out. Okay? What you want to compare here, what you're trying to do is compare numbers, numbers that represent a property for a galaxy or whatever. Okay? And at the moment, when the H's are out, that Value is a number plus that uncertainty. So assume a value for that uncertainty and do it for all your data, and then you'll have a number, assuming that cosmology. Okay? And we know the cosmology well enough that you should be able to do this without too many issues, unless you're looking for real precision stuff. Um, then you don't have to worry about little h's at all. Okay? Don't get yourself tied up in trying to make them all have the same amount of, uh, of H's, okay? So modelers love to use data to calibrate their models, right? So how, how do they deal with these little H differences? So let, let me just show you an example of why we should do this, why we should just put in the actual value of little H, right, as measured from Planck or whatever you think it is, right? Say that at the start of your paper and forget about it. Maybe put the little H's in the sub, maybe at the start say masses have this H dependence, luminosity has this H dependence and so on, that's fine. Um, but work with the numbers, not with the number plus a measurement uncertainty. Right? And I'll give you an example of why that is. Um, so we do have a question, um, which value do you use then? The Planck value or the distance ladder measurement? Uh, it's a good question. Um, 
I would say pick the one you, that you believe the most. Um, I would probably use the Planck value, and I would say that clearly at the start, and in that section where I'm talking about my cosmology, I would say all the properties that I'm measuring in this paper, um, and here, it, here is how little h factors in the measurement uncertainties. But everything that gets presented will be actual numbers assuming this cosmology. Um, and then if, you worry, if you're worried about that 5% difference or whatever between 0.73 and 0.69 or whatever it is, whatever the percentage difference is in what you're doing, then, yeah, then you know, worry about that seriously. But otherwise, I would say you've probably got much, much bigger errors in your data already. Um, factor it into the error bars and just leave it at that. Okay? I think that's the sensible way to do it. And so here's... Um, sorry. Okay, so let me give you an example of what issues can happen when you calibrate models, and I'm really guilty of this, right? So here's a model, right, and some data, okay? The green is a stellar mass function from Baldry et al. for Sloan, and the black line is a semi-analytic model that I made, okay? And here I'm assuming h of 1, which is mathematically equivalent to the h's factored out. So I've pulled the h's out, and this is what we almost always do. Um, we pull the H's out as, as modelers when we calibrate, okay? Um, and, well, looks awesome, right? Well done, Darren, high five, okay? Uh, your model is perfect, okay? You should be congratulated, all right? So that's wonderful. I published that paper, um, collect the glory, uh, all that sort of stuff. Oh, uh, Plank comes out, has knocked down the error bars and little H. Now we should do what uh, Signe has recommended, just, uh, and, and Alexander, just use the actual value, okay? Because we know it, okay? Let's put that in, okay? So let's now put that into the model and put that into the data. And this is what happens when we do that, okay? Oh, my wonderful model has now disintegrated. Remember, the y-axis here is a log scale. So the differences over here are incredibly large. Suddenly, my great model is looking pretty average, okay? So why is that, right? The y-axis for both model and data has have moved the same because this is just a volume, and volume has inverse h cube dependence. Um, it, it's the same in the in the simulations as it is in the data. Okay, but as we discussed before, mass has a different dependence when measured through luminosity than measured through dynamics, and in the model, it's measured through dynamics, and in observations, it's measured through luminosity. All right, so they've moved differently, and this is no longer a good model, okay? So, reinforces that point that you really need to, you really, really, really need to just put the little h's in. Say at the start what you're using, say how the little h's scale in each of the properties that you're presenting, and but then forget about it, okay? It will be clear, be concise, you won't have to worry about anything after that. Um, and neither will people in five years' time reading your paper trying to figure out how to use your data because they want to cite you. Okay, so here are some things to make your life easier. So this is my cheat sheet. Um, and I'll just present these in bullets, right? And I've said this, I'll just keep saying it. Little h is not a unit, it's a number. It's like E or gravitational constant or Planck's constant, it's a number. Okay? It just happens to be we don't exactly know what the value of that number is, but it's not a unit, it's just a number. Secondly, little h is measurement dependent. Right? It's not an intrinsic property of the thing you're measuring. It's a function of how you measure that thing. Okay? So don't forget that. When you see a little h in a property, it's most likely being factored out. So when you see solar masses on H or minus 5 log H or something like that, more than likely they've pulled out the little H's. So that was case 4. Okay? So it's handy to know. So that's the most common usage. So whenever you want to put your property into a particular cosmology, just replace the little H's with the number and evaluate. Okay, very simple. So I see Lewis has posted a question, um, but I'll get to your question in a second if that's okay, Lewis. Um, as we've said, to convert between little h cosmologies, you just reverse what you would have done to 
put it into that cosmology, and then do that again, but with the value you actually want. It's just very simple mathematics. You're not cancelling units or anything like that, because not a unit. Um, H of 1 and H is factored out uh, are mathematically equivalent, um, but they're actually very different things. Okay? One assumes a cosmology, the other doesn't assume a cosmology. And I might be nitpicking a little bit here, but a lot of the problems that come about are conceptual. Um, and, and so just avoid that pain by understanding that, that difference and, and not even going there. All right, little h can manifest in different ways in a property, okay? And the property will then scale differently if you scale, if you change that little h. So really important um, for people working with with theory and observational data, surface density, stellar masses, stuff like that. Um, don't multiply, divide to get rid of extra h's. Just choose a cosmology and convert. Um, your life will be much much happier. Um, I think that uh, that's probably you know one of the that that is the take-home message here um, it, it is just put everything in the right cosmology or the or a cosmology and clearly say it. And so this is the final point, right? You might disagree with everything I've said here. You might not like it, but please, please always state what you've assumed and how you've done it, and be consistent throughout your paper with that. So clearly, clearly, clearly state it because uh, you may understand it. Your your community. Uh, your community may understand it. Um, however, it may be that in five years' time, two years' time, or whenever, ten years' time, um, it's that's just lost. That understanding is not obvious, or the field has moved. Um, and there's so many examples of this in the literature now that obvious things are no longer obvious. So just be really clear and explicit. I mean, that's just science. Okay. And so. Not all of you are cat lovers, but the dog lovers. Let me just finish with a picture of the puppy, just to make you feel good as we leave. And um, I'll go on and answer any questions. We, you know, we have a few minutes left, um, and uh, and and then we'll finish up. So Lewis asked a question. Um, in my opinion, which branch of cosmology do does, has bigger implications for the H factors? Um, mass, luminosity, scale, CMB, physics, PO, supernova. I mean, uh, it's it's all of them, really. Uh, as uh, um, as Chris uh, said um, before, you know, Soran data is quite close, so these don't have a big impact on the final results. But you know, they may be compared to other results later on. Um, and and you know people might be trying to do consistent things and misunderstand how those other analyses have, have been done. Um, so I would just say all of them. It really this is all pretty basic stuff. It's just understanding, right? It's just conceptual, and just being method methodical. But it doesn't take any effort uh, to do properly. So I would say just do it properly from the start and be very clear about what you've done, and you'll save a whole lot of pain for yourself and for other people. And you know there are lots of grad students uh, listening and so you know at the moment you're in grad student world but you know hopefully you'll be professor you'll live in professor land one day and you'll have students right and your students will be scratching their heads trying to figure this stuff out from your old papers so you're not just doing it for them you're doing it for yourself when you have to sit down and rework it out with them later as well so you know so the benefits just flow in in all directions okay so I don't see any other questions. Let me just check all my screens. Um, all right, so if there are no other questions and it's almost at the top of the hour, uh, let me thank you for joining us. Um, I hope this hasn't been too basic. If it has been too basic, then, uh, uh, then that's Great news for the com community because uh, I, I think uh, I think you know there are a lot of conceptual problems that can really you know waste time. Basically, this is just time wasters when we figure out we've done it wrong um, and frustration. So you know, so take this to heart, um, digest it, uh, tell other people about it who may be you know doing the data analysis and trying to figure out the same 
same things. There will be a paper out on PASA soon. Uh, I'm going to put on Astra PH when I've uh, dealt with the, the referees report, which is almost done. Um, but there was a link to it in the Google, uh, in the box on the Google Plus page anyway. So feel free to download it and have a look. And, and like I said, uh, you know, it's really that last section that you need, which is where I just lay out those uh, those uh, bullet points, that cheat sheet of, of how you should deal with uh, the Hubble constant. Um, in your analysis and for most of the time that you do spend doing astronomy um, none of it will be relevant and all of it will seem obvious until you hit that one moment where it doesn't make sense and you think you've screwed up something bad in, in your work and you know you're banging your head against the screen so hopefully it'll be uh, um, um, useful at that point um, Okay, so we'll leave it there. Uh, we will announce uh, soon the next lecture. Um, we're hoping it will be a coding one, but we've got to confirm. Um, there's been a number of people who put their hands up to uh, to give stuff from running simulations to statistics to a whole host of things. Uh, if you have a topic that you would like us to talk about or organize a lecture for, let us know. And we'll see if we can arrange someone. So until then, thank you, everyone, and I uh, hope you have a great weekend. Bye.